Welcome to the Web Marketing That Works podcast, episode number 29. My name is Toby Jenkins, and today we have on the show CEO, author, and friend, Vern Harnish. Vern is the founder of Gazelles, Inc., which serves as an outsourced corporate university for mid-sized firms and hosts a faculty of well-known business experts like Jim Collins, Jeff Smart, Jack Stack, Neil Rackham, Seth Godden, quite a number of names I hope you know. If you don't, I would highly recommend that you jump in and get amongst those people because they're amazing thought leaders. Vern, in fact, has been the person over and above anyone else who has introduced us to and exposed us to the world of these business experts, and it's been fantastic to be a part of his community. Vern himself is the author of Mastering the Rockefeller Habits, and again, Adam and I have spoken about this on previous podcasts. It it was a really foundational book for our business. He's also written The Greatest Business Decisions of All Time and regularly writes a growth column for Small Business Magazine. Vern also founded Young Entrepreneurs Organization and the Association of Collegiate Entrepreneurs. In this show, we really dive into Vern's concept of owning the ink, which is all about how Vern has used content and publishing to really establish a reputation and build authority around his business education sector. And I think there's a heap of lessons that we can all learn from what Vern's done. And he goes into some of the things that have worked, some of the things that haven't worked, and how it's sort of been built out piece by piece to become this incredible marketing machine, an inbound marketing machine too, that means that he has virtually zero marketing costs. The final part of what we talk about in the interview is actually to do with Vern's family and how the things he's learned in business have applied to his family. And for me, that's really topical with a little child coming up, my first coming up very soon. So I was really interested to hear Vern's take on that particular scenario too. So I really hope you enjoy the show. Podcast. Come behind the scenes of real life marketing experiments and listen in as amazing guests confess the truth about what really works. Now, here are your hosts, Adam Franklin and Toby Jenkins. As always, this show is brought to you by the 33 free web marketing templates that come with the Web Marketing That Works book. You can download those over at www.bluewiremedia.com.au backslash book. Let's get on with the show. Well, thanks so much for joining me on the show, Vern. Really appreciate it. Glad to be here, Toby. That's great. So a little bit of background, if we can, on you, Vern, just to kick off. Um, what is Gazelles? How, how did it start? How's it changed over the years? Would you mind sort of giving well, us a bit of a rundown? You bet. Well, uh, as you know, I launched uh, the Entrepreneurs Organization in 87, built uh, this program that's hosted at MIT called The Birthing of Giants, now called EMP, and we've moved about 1,500 uh, EO members and others through that executive program. And it was out of that that uh, I launched Gazelles then a decade later in 97, and we've really been focused on sharing the same tools that I was teaching for many, many years there at the MIT program, and we've built up about 100 and 40 coaching partners on the way to 200 around the globe to be local on six continents to support people and doing one thing, you know, just trying to keep the wheels from falling off as you scale up a business and, and try to enjoy the ride along the way. So that's been our focus for Gazelles. Yeah, right. That's awesome. And, uh, and how's your role in the business changed then over that time? Well, you know, we have this tool called FACE, our function accountability chart. And I realized early on when I kind of took her own advice that I shouldn't really be head of the company. I've, I really enjoy the innovation R&D side of creating the new tools and the new information that we're pulling together uh, to share with our audience. So I've brought in a group of CEOs, you know, real talented uh, entrepreneurs to really lead our various companies, and that has worked extremely well. And it's given me the freedom to move to Barcelona, Spain, where uh, from where I'm talking with you right now. Yeah, that's unreal. I love that part of it. I'm a huge fan of Barcelona, as you know. Um, yes. from my years playing water polo over there. Um, so, Vern, that's that's a great background. Thank you for uh, for the listeners. I'd love to dive into your concept of owning the ink today. 
Because from what I've seen, you've done it exceptionally well. And it's certainly something that Adam and I have strived to emulate over the years. And just, I guess, to give it a little bit of context as well, um, when we first started out, uh, mentors and friends really recommended Mastering the Rockefeller Habits as a book that we needed to read when we started out on our business journey and also recommended your one-page strategic plan. And from that, we got to know you, got to really, we, you know, we really liked what the book was about. We then came along to one of your workshops you know, have then done interviews with you, followed advice of speakers at your events and what have you, and in fact, you know, traveled the world to see the events that you've put on, um, which has just been an incredible part of our business and learning journey. So thank you. Thank you very much for that. But to me, that, that sort of typifies um, that, uh, you know, owning the ink concept is the actual journey that we went on. And in fact, we've tried to sort of emulate it in numbers of ways. But can you sort of explain what you mean by owning the ink? Well, I think it's that notion that today nobody really wants to be sold. They want to be educated, Toby. And that's been our marketplace particularly. In fact, you can't even really get entrepreneurs' attention if you're trying to throw some kind of a marketing or sales message in front of them. They don't have time to read it. They don't have time to see anybody if you want to send a salesperson to go talk to them. But they're interested in becoming educated about what it takes for them to scale up their business. And so uh, it was. Yeah, it started with the book, finally codifying what it was that I'd been teaching for all those years at that MIT program and put in the book Mastering the Rockefeller Habits. And then um, going out there and positioning ourselves with, for instance, one of the leading business publications, Fortune Magazine. And I'm their longstanding venture columnist now. Uh, which is given a great audience for our particular work. And then these weekly insights that you know you put, we put together every Thursday goes out to almost 50,000 uh, leaders like yourself and other executives to, I think the idea is to first give uh, before you receive. Uh, we just had Adam Grant, uh, the author of Give and Take. And I think he's right. You know, if you can kind of put out good positive information, and uh, I think then the universe is going to reward that with, uh, you know, through the rule of reciprocity, some business coming back the other way. But you have to be willing to put it out there first. And that's why, for instance, in our case, all of our tools are open source. Anybody can download them free of charge, have forever. And, you know, the tools with a copy of the book, and they can get a long way in terms of implementing our, our Rockefeller habits inside their organization. So I think, again, it comes back to you know, nobody wants to be sold. They, they just want to be educated. And then you've got to figure out, all right, where are your core customers hanging out? And can you give them some information that they deem is going to be useful to them? And that's how you begin to nurture a long-term relationship. Yeah, I love that. <laughs> I certainly love that philosophy. Um, and so I'm interested to sort of, you know, you've kind of covered quite a, quite a few areas of um, how you know, including the column, the tools, and all that kind of stuff. So, if you don't mind, just sort of taking it back one step, um, is when when did you sort of realize that this might be a powerful strategy for your business? Well, it's a little bit easier, I think, Toby, in my space because you know we're in the business education world, and I think you know your first entry point has to be the production of a book. And even though there's six thousand business books out there every year, it's Still, there's millions of folks that are putting themselves out as thought leaders around the business world. And that book really differentiates you. And so, as you know, we've really been pushing CEOs of all companies, no matter what the industry, to first and foremost, write a book. And it becomes the best calling card that you can give away to prospective customers, to prospective employees. I think it's a great marketing tool to attract talent. And it raises your visibility in your own industry. Uh, look, if you've written the book, you're instantly kind of labeled the thought leader of that space. And you're going to get invited to speak or at least lead panels at your industry trade association meetings. And the ability to raise your visibility within the industry is important. Plus, folks in the media, uh, we're all generally pretty lazy. And we know that if you've taken the effort to organize your thoughts into a book – 
that it's going to be much easier to interview you, to quote you. And so uh, as people in the media, we look for uh, authors, particularly business leaders who've written books. Uh, we turn to them for the various articles that we need to write. So I think first step is everybody listening to this needs to figure out what's the book they need to write. And by the way, you don't have to write it. You know, We all have ghostwriters. And you just find somebody who has recently done an article. My very first book, Mastering the Rockefeller Habits, was uh, ghostwritten. Obviously, they're all my ideas, but go- ghostwritten by Alan Wojohn, who had written the original six-page article about uh, me and this association of collegiate entrepreneurs that I had co-founded back in the, in the early 80s. Right. So that would be step one. Yeah, sure. That, okay. And, and is that how you then sort of came to be – was that sort of the first step to then you um, getting the opportunity to write the column then for Fortune? It is. Well, one of the things that had always been part of my MO was when I co-founded Ace, we had uh, Venture Magazine as a partner. Then I launched EO and quickly partnered with Inc. Magazine. And so when I launched Gazelles, really my first for-profit uh, venture, I said, hey, why don't I still use the same uh, kind of idea, and that is partner with a major publication of the business world. And so it, it's Fortune today. And that's been a great platform for us to kind of get our word out. How did you sort of come to write Mastering the Rockefeller Habits? Was that due to the column that you were writing for Fortune at the time, or was it a combination of the two? No, it was actually in reverse order. There were, during the dot-com kind of explosion, there were all these online companies popping up, and one of them was this firm called Fatbrain, and they wanted to become the depository on the planet for information. And so they contracted with several authors to write a series of articles. So got a nice advance. I used that to pay Ellen to write a series of eight articles, and those eight articles essentially became – eight of the ten chapters in uh, Mastering the Rockefeller Habits. The ninth chapter was a piece that I wrote for Fortune magazine. And we combined those together plus a tenth chapter and voila, had a book. Uh, So I would really encourage folks to start out with, hey, I'm going to go to my industry trade association. I'm going to agree to write uh, an informative column. Go get a professional writer to do it for you so that it's well received. And you can then take those columns or those articles and piece them together into what's going to be your initial book. Yeah, that's really cool. And so um, then the other piece of the puzzle that we were sort of talking about a little bit earlier was the the one-page strategic plan, your your other tools, your growth tools that you do offer for free. And I'll, I'll make sure there's links to that in the show notes. But did the tool come before the book or the book before the tool? Uh, you know, what was the order there? Well, you know what? The book forced us to get organized around the tools. Before that, we had this thing called the planning pyramid. So it was a conceptual one-page strategic plan, but it was only when we actually created the form. And nature abhors a vacuum. And so the fact that there were these boxes that people needed to fill in was a simple enough driver for people to actually get this thing done. And I'm a mechanical engineer by training and a big fan of Buckminster Fuller who said, look, you can't change the way people think. All you can do is give them a tool, the use of which will change their thinking. And so that's what created our toolbox for growth companies. Yeah, right. And how has that sort of tool, you know, what, toolkit worked for you? Because, I mean, it's such an, you know, as I say, in terms of our journey with you, that, that was one of the first things that we came across. Well, it's that idea of having a freemium product. So, you know, the tools are up there for free. Folks can download them. I even have a book, a video book that's free right now that people can use to kind of go through the forms and figure out how they need to fill them in. It's, it's pretty, you know, self-serving. I mean, it, it, it's self-service kind of um, offering. Mm. And from that, if people run into obstacles or need some help, they'll email. And we have some coaching partners and some workshops and some other ways that we can actually help them get the boxes filled in. But it's totally optional. And a lot of folks can kind of figure it out on their own. Others, if they want to speed up the process and do it more thoroughly, we're there to to give them a hand. So it's it's really our key freemium option that we provide to our marketplace. 
Yeah, and I guess, you know, in terms of that nurture and building of trust process, that gives them a pathway to follow, right? Exactly. And then, then all you do is rely on word of mouth. It's that inbound marketing that is most important where you've got people calling you instead of you calling them. We got a call the other day from a partner from Google Capital, which is a new venture that's been launched inside Google. And it's because he's a YPO who's a, in the form of a longstanding client of ours that's kind of gone from you know, 20 million to 200 million using our tools. And he's been hearing enough from Larry about how powerful our methodologies are that he called and said, all right, come on out. And this summer, I'll be out there at Google Capital, lending a hand. Wow, that's really cool. And will that be you personally or are you sending one of the coaches? That one's going to start out with me personally, but I'm going to have one of our coaching partners with us so that I'm able then to, to transition the opportunity. Yeah, sure. And the other piece of the puzzle that we were talking about earlier as well was is your email. And I mean, your email is one of the very few that A, I nearly always open and B, that is allowed into my inbox without sort of being filtered off into a subscription folder. Um, uh, when did you sort of kick off your weekly updates? You know, that came out of, again, the MIT program because, you know, executives came for four days a year for three years in a row which meant there was a lot of time between, you know, the two sessions. And so there were, I felt this need to continue to communicate ideas and stay in touch with those early students. And out of that was really birthed this, this idea of a weekly insight. Right. And then that, and that sort of became the basis that you started, you know, you continued to communicate with that same group of people when Gazelles launched? It is. In fact, you know, for our big summits now that we run all over the world, including there in Sydney, um, we I really don't have any marketing expense except, you know, it does take me three hours every Thursday. That's the one thing that I write myself. And I use it as an opportunity to kind of, you know, pull in ideas that I'm interested in and, and kind of get my collective thoughts organized. So it's a useful exercise just personally. Mm-hmm. But, you know, it's three hours every Thursday. And, that's essentially been our key marketing tool, if you would, then to encourage folks to take a look at the workshops and come to the summits and, and take advantage of stuff that we do charge for in addition to the, the free stuff. Yeah. Oh, that's, that's really cool. And your, your list is now, as you said, around 50,000, right? How, how long has, have you been growing that list? Yeah, and you know, it, it probably should be bigger if I would focus more on it, but it's taken 10 years to get there. Right. Okay. And how important would you say it is to your business then, your email list? It, well, it's everything. It's our, it's our funnel. You know, everybody talks about needing to have a sales funnel. And, you know, the first step is for people to read the book or hear about what we're doing, sign up for the weekly insights. And then it's a one, two, three, five, ten year nurture marketing cycle. You know, I, I'm always fascinated how folks will say, hey, I've been reading your insights for years. And I think I'm finally ready to come to a workshop or I'm really looking forward to coming to my first summit. And they've been, you know, in our nurture marketing database for a decade. But that's kind of how it is. You know, when the, when the student's ready, the teacher appears, but it's good. <laughs> like tire, it's kind of like tire ads. You just have to be always there available so when they are ready, they can find you quickly. And so I'm showing up in their lives every Thursday. Yeah, it's really nice. And do you do you uh, do anything in terms of splitting up your email database, or is it just a, the same thing goes to everyone? Well, we do have it by geography and by function. So we find out particularly if somebody is a CEO versus CFO or CMO within the organization. There's six of those categories, right. and then obviously we under we work hard to find out where they're located geographically, so that when we offer a you know, summit in Sydney, you know, there's no reason for me to be promoting that to everybody outside except those that would be in Australia and nearby. We do a workshop in Chicago. We will then send out a special message about that just to the folks in that particular region. So we're not bugging everybody about everything. So no, we, we use a technology called Infusionsoft. And from there we use it to do our nurture marketing. Yeah. Okay. That's great. It's, it's really because that concept of sort of database fatigue is something that seems to be popping up a little bit at the moment and it's interesting to hear how you're sort of preventing that by just 
making sure that each message is relevant. Yeah. And the other thing we're doing, and we, again, I'm literally looking for my first chief marketing officer here in 2014, is we also, through our data collection, know of the four decisions, people, strategy, execution, and cash, which one of those is each individual's initial pain point. And with that, we can then target uh, some specific solutions so that we're addressing their issue and not some kind of a general offering. And so it's, it's, every day it's, it's learning more about specifically what is the customer's pain points and making sure that we're bringing some relevant content that's going to help them address that pain point. Yeah, awesome. Um, well, Vern, thanks so much for sort of diving into that. I really appreciate the detail you shared there. Um, I'm okay. also keen to hear a bit more about uh, your new book coming up, Scaling Up, um, which has a workshop that the growth faculty is putting on in Australia and New Zealand in September. So can you give us a bit of a rundown on that? You know, why, why, why have you chosen to write a new book and now and what's it about and what can people look forward to sort of reading about? Well, it's mainly uh, a significant update to Mastering the Rockefeller Habits, which came out a dozen years ago. And we've learned some things, you know, since then. And so <laughs> the <deal>. idea, <laughs> yeah, so the idea is, uh, you know, what we've really learned is more about what doesn't work than what does work. And so yeah. that's a significant portion of the new book. And we've subtitled it or kind of super titled it Rockefeller Habits 2.0. So it is the major update to our tools, to our methodologies, to our learning, to the case studies uh, of companies that have now been practicing these tools for many, many years. And so excited. It's coming out in October. The very first workshops around the new book are actually going to be in New Zealand and Australia the first week of September. And so excited even to roll out a brand new formatted workshop around uh, the book. And everybody at the workshop is going to get a copy of the new book. Awesome. Well, I'll make sure, I'll make sure there's a link to the, uh, the growth faculty um, event page there for that. Absolutely. For people who are keen to follow up on that. And so- You bet. Do you mind, you know, is there something from, you know, the, the differences, I guess, compared to the Rockefeller Habits um, to this new update, what has been like one thing that really surprised you or one thing that stands out for you in terms of the difference or learning? Well, well, I think, I think the substantial update is the Rockefeller Habits was primarily focused on execution. And if we look at really the, the four areas that you have to focus on if you're going to scale up a business, the people side the strategy side, and also the cash, in addition to execution, we've really bolstered our learning and tools in those three other areas. So whereas there was really just a one-pay strategic plan, which was an execution tool in Rockefeller Habits, close to a dozen tools around people, strategy, execution, and cash that we've outlined in the new book. And, and so that's, that's the significant update. Awesome. I'll, I'll uh, really look forward to really look forward to seeing a copy of that, Vern. That'll be unreal. Um, will you give those tools? Will they all be available on your website as well? They are. In fact, they're up there currently. We've been uh, obviously beta testing the new tools over the last year with several of our audiences. Now we've gone in to make some final tweaks, and uh, they'll be rolled out formally, hopefully in various languages. We're in the process now of getting those translated because uh, we're working with multiple languages now around the world. So, yeah, the, the, the first format of those new growth tools are up on the gazelles.com website. Okay, well, I'll, I'll track those down and put a link to that in the notes too. Um, and final question then for you, Vern, um, is a bit of a personal question because I, one of the things that I've really enjoyed in your updates over the years has been your um, insights um, into being a father and part of a family and how you, you know, you've often sort of made reference to the Rockefeller habits in the context of your family as well. Um, I've got a little child coming up in a couple of months um, and so it's really Congrats. relevant to me and yes. hopefully to a few listeners as well. But I, yeah, really interested to hear you know, some of the things that you've done in that regard with your family because I, I have thoroughly enjoyed that sort of side of your newsletters as well. Yeah, good. Um, yeah, you know, it, it, was, it was really uh, Tom Meredith who was the gentleman who was brought in by the board at Dell when Michael Dell at age 26 had gotten in trouble with the business. 
And he was the one that first turned me on to this parent effectiveness uh, training called PET, where he, when he came in to become the CFO for Dell and help Michael go from a billion to 30 billion, he was the one who pointed out that, you know, at the end of the day, kind of, you know, driving a family and driving a business, there's a lot of similarities. You know, starting with the meeting rhythm, you know, it's a critical that my wife and I uh, sit down for 15 minutes of focus time every day so she can primarily download to me what's going on in her life. She, you know, that's critical in a relationship. And, and you think there's time to do that just in passing, but with children and all the hectiness that's going on, it, it just doesn't if you don't make time. The importance of the weekly meeting with the family so that you guys can, if nothing else, we can get focused around what are our family's core values and are we living those? And, and I do think, you know, we talk about in a company, the importance of having a handful of rules, repeating yourself a lot and hoping something stick. I, <laughs> I've sensed parenting is the same way. You know, we've got kind of a handful of rules. You know, I've been repeating myself a lot. And as we were talking about, my son graduated from high school this week, this past weekend. And mm. hopefully some of that is stuck. <laughs> and uh, he can go out now and make some great decisions uh, or at least survive his bad decisions <laughs> uh, as, as, he, as he begins to move on. Uh, and one of the things that's our new brand new tool is a one-page personal plan. You know, just like we think you need that for the business, we've created one for the family and for yourself. And it's related around the same things, people, strategy, execution, and cash. Though the people's really relationships, uh, we're looking at uh, what are the achievements that you want that would be relative to kind of your strategy. What are the rituals or routines that you need to change? You know, if you want to lose weight, it does you no know, good to say that unless you change some of your daily, weekly routines or rituals. Mm -hmm. And then wealth is the equivalent of cash. And both, what is your number that you want to achieve? But more importantly, what are you going to do with that wealth uh, to make the world a better place? And so we've created this one-page personal plan to mirror the one-page strategic plan uh, in our new tools. Wow. That's really cool. It's nice to um, – must be a good feeling, I would imagine, to be able to translate you know, that context into a personal and family context as well, environment. It is, but uh, we also have therapy funds for all of our children. You know, it's tough to you know, be uh, the children of a business teacher. I think almost much like being uh, the child of a preacher, not, not too much different. And so uh, they have survived. I think the children have survived despite, you know, dad coming home with the latest new idea that we're going to try out on the family. Yeah, right. they've been the guinea pigs for quite a while, hey? Oh, they have, and it's a big joke around here. Thank goodness they have a a, a great mother, and I have a great wife. <laughs> That's awesome, because you guys also celebrated a wedding anniversary um, not long ago. Was that two weeks ago? Three weeks. It ago? was. Yeah, our, our twenty second. We've known each other for twenty four years. We just celebrated our twenty second anniversary, and wow, congratulations! And, and I can say our relationships uh, stronger and as strong as it's ever been, and and that's. That's been fantastic because I'll tell you, when there's issues at home, it's hard then to stay focused on business. Yeah, I yeah, can on, only imagine. So, um, oh, that's really cool, Vern, and I really appreciate you sort of sharing that with us as well. I'm interested just uh, with your 15 minute daily that you do with your wife. Is that a particular? You know, is it particular time each day? Is it, or is it just something you do first thing in the morning, last thing at night? No, we tend to do it around six o'clock in the evening, uh, just before dinner. Uh, and by the way, it came from one of you know my mentors, Doctor uh, Stephen Bars, Rabbi Bars, mm. who said, you know, one of the f mistakes that we make is we treat our children like we should our spouse, and we treat our spouse like we should our children. And I'm like, what? And my wife and I went to one of his blissful relationship courses years ago, mm. and he said, you know, when your children come home from school. You know, the first thing we do is ask them, you know, how was your day? It's the last thing they want to be asked. They don't want to tell you. They just want <laughs> you around. And so I've consciously made sure since we went to that workshop not to ask them that question. And sure enough, later that evening, maybe later that week, whatever, maybe the next morning, they'll volunteer themselves. Hey, by the way, Dad, wanted to let you know this, that, and the other thing. In turn... Your spouse, so your children want quantity, not quality. Your spouse, on the other hand, 
that's the person that does want you to ask, you know, so how was your day? What's up? What's been going on? And, and then, you know, they want you to get lost uh, the rest of the evening. And so that was one significant change that we made is I quit asking the children how was their day and let them come to me. And mm-hmm. Julie does the same thing. And in turn, making sure that whether I'm on the road or I'm home, that I check in and I let, you know, Julie download, you know, what's been happening for the day. Mm. So she feels heard. Yeah. Oh, it makes perfect sense. That's great advice. Um, oh, well, Vern, look, thank you so much. I, you know, conscious of time and really appreciate you um, taking half an hour out of your day, particularly um, when you're just getting back to work. So thank you so much for all of that. Um, you bet, Toby. Anytime. Thank you, mate. Um, final, final thing is uh, how can people connect with you? You know, the easiest is just go to gazelles.com. That's the name that the economists have given growth companies in the economy. So it's G-A-Z or Z-E-L-L-E-S.com. And up there, you can sign up for the insights. You can download the tools, a lot of articles, all, links to all my fortune articles, and some pretty cool interviews that we did with some of the top thought leaders like Adam Grant and others coming out of our growth summit a couple of weeks ago. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much again, Vern, and uh, really look forward to catching up in September. And um, yeah, it's been great to have you on the show. Yeah, and Toby, you've been, you, you guys have been such great students of business. That's why uh, you're doing so well uh, with your business. And so I look forward to seeing you in September as well. Thanks, Vern. Adios. Bye. Don't forget to download the 33 free web marketing templates from bluewiremedia.com.au backslash book. Thanks so much. Catch you next time.